This this meeting is being recorded. This is Chemistry 1010 Lab, Section 51. Good morning, I hope everyone had a good week this week. And so today we're going to be doing the Particulate Nature of Matter Lab. And this will be a continuation of our conversation about matter that we have been having in chapter one. And so some things that we've talked about in lecture about matter one of the major focuses has been on the states of matter. And so we know that there are three main states of matter that we're concerned with in our introductory chemistry class. And that's the, those are the states of solid, liquid, and gas. And then there's another kind of form of a liquid state that we consider in chemical reactions and in, in, uh, as far as uh, reagents are concerned and what we use uh, in experiments in, in, in a basic chemistry laboratory setting. And those are aqueous solutions. And aqueous solutions, of course, are made when you take a solid substance, you dissolve it in another liquid substance. It's complete, the solid is completely soluble in the liquid and therefore dissolves completely in the liquid, being evenly distributed throughout that liquid once you mix or stir that solid in. So, and when your liquid is water, it's called an aqueous solution, but it's still in the liquid state. So we call that a special type of liquid state that we'll see uh, in throughout the semester, especially when we're dealing with chemical reactions. And so with the three states of matter being solid, liquid, and gas that we're going to focus on in this lab and throughout the semester, if we want to talk about solids, liquids, and gases from a particulate point of view, then we're talking about at the microscopic or submicroscopic level. What does a solid look like? What does a sample of a liquid look like? What does a sample of a gas look like at the particulate level? And so when you're comparing and contrasting solids, liquids, and gases on the particulate level, you want to consider a few things. You want to consider, well, how close are the particles of a solid, of a liquid, of a gas? How close are those particles to each other? And then in addition to analyzing how close the particles of each type are to each other, then you want to ask yourself the question, well, does this substance have its own shape? when it's in a solid state or when it's in a liquid state or when it's in a gas state? Does a gas, does the particles that make up a gas have their own shape? Does the particles that make up a liquid have their own shape? Do the particles that make up a solid have their own shape? In addition to their own shape, do they have their own volume? 
can you actually measure the volume of this substance in a solid state, a liquid state, or a gas state? So those are the three questions you want to ask yourself when you're analyzing solids and liquids and gases. But then on the particulate level also, you want to analyze them based on how close in proximity are the particles that make up a solid, liquid, and gas are to each other. And what's the freedom of movement of those particles? Do the particles have complete freedom of movement, limited freedom of movement, or virtually no freedom of movement at all? So when we look at particles of a solid, those particles are arranged in a structured, ordered pattern. They have a regular repeating pattern. So they're in this structured, ordered format. And they are very, very close together. They are touching. And so the particles are touching. And so they have no freedom of movement. Now the particles of a liquid on the other hand they are close to one another, but they aren't touching. But they are not in any type of structured or ordered pattern. They're in a random arrangement. And so they have limited, they have a limited freedom of movement. On the other hand, the particles of a gas are in a random arrangement. They're not in any type of structured or ordered pattern, but, and, but they are not close to each other. These particles are spread far apart. So they have complete freedom of movement. And so I draw the little arrows to indicate that they have complete freedom of movement. And because they have complete freedom of movement, they have kinetic energy, which I will abbreviate KE. And so with the liquids, I'll only put like a little tiny arrow. because they have very limited freedom of movement. So we'll say they have negligible, not very much, not very significant amounts of kinetic energy. And because solids have no freedom of movement, they have no kinetic energy. So solid particles do not move in relationship to each other. No movement, but solid particles can vibrate.
So they have no movement with respect to each other, but they can vibrate in place. So this is how we describe the differences between solids, liquids, and gases at the particulate level. How close are the particles to each other with respect to each other? And do they have freedom of movement? And then also, like we did last week, we described the differences between solids, liquids, and gases based on whether or not they have their own shape and their own volume. So now that we've gone over uh, the differences on the particulate level, the differences between solids, liquids, and gases, now we're ready to start the lab. Before we start the lab, I just wanna let you know that over this long weekend, I'm going to be finishing up the grading on your classification of matter lab that you submitted last week. When you finish this lab at the end of today's lab period, you'll have until 11.59 p.m. tonight to submit your data sheets from today. And I will get both labs graded this weekend. So you'll have your grades in the lab eLearn gradebook this weekend. Uh, before next lab meeting, make sure you take a look at your graded submission. Read any comments uh, that I add for your submission. Um, and then if you have any questions about your graded lab report, send me an email one day next week before our next lab meeting. And so today's lab has six different parts, A through F. And so for each part, there is a video to accompany each part that you will watch on your own device. And then you'll go into your group meeting room and you will discuss the questions for that part with your group members and you will complete the questions for that part. Then you'll return to the general meeting room. We'll do a quick discussion of any questions you may have about the particular part that you just watched a video of and met with your group about, and then we'll move on to the next part. So we'll be going back and forth between our group meeting rooms and the general meeting room. So the first part, part A, is the smelly balloon. And so what I did was I took a balloon and I placed a liquid inside of the balloon. And in placing the liquid inside of the balloon, then uh, I, I first inflated the balloon and then while the balloon was partially inflated, I used a little pipette and I added like a little medicine dropper and I added the liquid to the balloon and then I further inflated the balloon and then I tied the balloon off so that the balloon stayed inflated. So to access the videos for this week, you go to our eLearn lab our lab e-learn site and you go to course content and then you go to the table of contents and choose week two the particulate nature of matter you'll see your lab report sheet there and then here's the playlist for all of the videos for the particulate nature of matter lab and you see you have parts A, B, C, D, E, and F videos. So you're going to start with part A.
You'll watch that video and then you'll answer questions one through three under part A, and then you'll return to the general meeting room. Of course, I'm going to be just playing the video, but you're not going to be able to hear the sound. To be able to see the video and hear the sound, you need to play the video on your own device. So to get again to get to your individual group meeting room, just click on Teams on the left-hand side of your screen. And then all of the groups should appear in, a, in, a, in addition to the general meeting room. So just click on your group's meeting room and that will take you to that group meeting room.
Does anyone need to know which group they are in? Is everyone clear on which group they are in and therefore which group meeting room to go in? So at this time, you should have watched the video by now and you should be in your group meeting rooms. So I see most of you are back into the meeting room. And so let's talk about your responses to questions one through three for part A. 
And so in observing the, the balloon, I told you that the balloon had a smelly odor coming from it. And some of the other things that you could have written in your observations, it had a red color, a round shape. And I do believe I also stated in the video, it had a smooth, rubbery feel to it. And the smell was a fishy, a fishy odor. So why could I smell the liquid that I placed inside of that balloon? Why could I smell it outside of the balloon? Is it because the particles have slight room to move because it's a liquid? So I heard someone uh, speaking, but your maybe your microphone is down low. Your volume is down low on your uh, device. So if you could turn up your volume on your device. I said, is it because the particles in the liquid have room to move around a little bit? And so you're saying that the particles are moving? Correct. So the particles move from inside of the balloon to outside of the balloon. I mean, I guess that's possible. I just thought in that them moving might help create. All right, and so in order for it, yeah, in order for me to smell it outside, it means that they're not totally trapped. Those particles are not totally trapped inside of the balloon, right? So the balloon, like most materials, even though you can't see the pores, the pores are the holes in the material of the balloon, they are microscopic as well, right? So even though you can't see the pores, but evidently the balloon is porous. Just like your cells in your body, those cells are, and just like the balloon, is considered to be what they call a semi-permeable membrane, meaning that substances can pass inside and outside of your cells in your body. That's what keeps you alive, right? And so the balloon evidently is like a semi-permeable membrane. It has tiny pores or holes, and that allows that liquid odor to pass through the material of the balloon. And so I agree with you. And Tessa, you were speaking correctly. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I, I I want to make sure that it was you. I thought I saw your name flash. And so, yes, Tessa is correct. The particles of that liquid have moved from inside of the balloon to outside of the balloon, and that's how I was able to smell the liquid. And so let's talk a little bit more about this balloon. So... If this is our our particles of the smelly liquid inside of the balloon, then what Tess is saying is that this is happening, that those particles, or some of them at least, are moving outside of the balloon. So therefore, in our picture that we will use to illustrate these microscopic particles 
moving outside of the balloon, you would draw something like this. And what's the energy of movement that we talked about earlier called? Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. Very good, Tessa. So what do we say about kinetic energy? Does, do solids have kinetic energy? No. no. Do, do liquids have appreciable kinetic energy? Very small. What about gases? Yes. Wow. So if they're moving, therefore they have to have kinetic energy in order to move. And to move outside of the balloon through the little tiny pores in the material that the balloon is made of. I put the liquid in the balloon and I closed the balloon tightly shut. I tied a very, very tight knot. on the ending of the balloon so that it was tight shut. What did that do to the liquid when I tied that balloon off very tightly in that tight knot? It created what inside of the balloon? Kinetic energy. So that tight knot, that created pressure. inside of the balloon. So when the liquid is in the room under normal atmospheric pressure, it stays a liquid. But when I put that liquid in that balloon and I tied that knot on the end of that balloon, that created pressure inside of the balloon. And in creating pressure inside of the balloon, that causes some of the liquid to be converted into what state? Gas. Gas. And therefore, those particles gain kinetic energy when they were converted from a liquid to a gas. And that's how they were able to move with kinetic energy from inside of the balloon to outside of the balloon and therefore allow me to smell it. So, some of those liquid particles under pressure had been converted to a gas and therefore they have the kinetic energy to move from inside of the balloon to outside of the balloon and therefore allow us to smell the smelly liquid. So with that discussion, I want you to complete that explanation. Any questions about part A? As you guys can see, I'm not an artist by any stretch of the imagination. I'm sure your picture will be prettier than mine. So everyone good with part A? Part B is a very short video. So basically I soaked a cotton ball in rubbing alcohol. And I drug that cotton ball soaked with alcohol across the lab bench. It left a wet streak. And so you are just to record your observations as you watch the area uh, on the lab bench that I streaked with the alcohol. And so for question four, write down what you observe, what you see in the video. And then question five, explain what happened to the alcohol at the particulate level. 
and then complete the little table explain in terms of matter being composed of individual submicroscopic particles and then also just like you did in part a draw a picture which illustrates your explanation so go ahead and watch part b go into your individual group rooms and let's return back to the general room by 945.
OK, I think most of us are back in the general room, so let's talk about. Part B questions four and five. And so what were some of the observations that you made? Uh, some of the things that you could have said are things like you saw a wet streak. So therefore the alcohol was a liquid. That it disappeared. After about. A minute or so. So did anyone else? Um, observe anything in addition to that? It was a pretty simple observation. You just saw a wet streak, a couple of wet streaks on the, on the lab bench, and the alcohol was definitely a liquid uh, when I put it on the lab bench. But then after a minute or so, it disappeared. And so therefore, what happened to the liquid at the particulate level? It changed from a liquid to a gas. Right, right. So the liquid evaporated or the liquid changed to a gas. And so in your picture, you started out with a liquid. With particles close together but not touching and very small negligible amounts of kinetic energy. And then after about one minute, it turned into a gas with the particles spread out far apart from each other and now with lots of kinetic energy. And so again, Based on the picture, put what the picture is saying into words. Any questions about part B? So next, go ahead and watch part C if there are no questions about part B. And then for part C, you're going to answer questions six and seven. As well as eight and nine, even though you didn't see me blow up the balloon, that's something that you've done yourself at one time or another. So basically, in answering questions six and seven, also answer questions eight and nine. When you blow into a balloon and you blow it up, you're transferring your exhaled breath, which is just air, into that balloon. And of course, that's what inflates it, the air from your exhaled breath. And so based on that, answer also questions eight and nine. And so go into your individual group rooms after you've watched the video for part C and then return to the general room at about 10 a.m.
So I think we're all back into the general room. So let's discuss part C, the traveling balloon. And so when I blew on one side of the balloon, you notice that the balloon moved. It moved oh, about a foot or so in distance. So if we remember from physical science or physics class, we know that force is one of the components that are required in order for work to be done on an object. So we can say that work was being done on the balloon by my breath. And all my breath is, is air. And air is a gas. And so when we breathe in air, we're breathing in. And air is going to be the one of the main topics of chapter two. So air that we inhale is about 78% nitrogen, N2, about 21% oxygen, O2, and 1% other gases. And some of those other gases are carbon dioxide, CO2, argon, which is a noble gas in group 8A of the periodic table with the symbol AR. And then there's also water vapor in the air. And of course, depending on where you live, uh, you may live in a more humid environment like here in Tennessee or in the South in general, or you may live in a more dry, arid climate like in, in Arizona or Colorado. But depending on where you, you live, there's a certain amount of moisture in the air, which is water vapor. Now your exhaled breath, what you breathe out, and that's what I blew on the balloon, your body doesn't absorb any of the nitrogen that you breathe in. So you breathe in 78% nitrogen, you breathe out 78% nitrogen. But your body is going to use a big portion of the oxygen that you breathe in, your cells are going to take that oxygen in so that your cells can do reactions known as cellular respiration uh, coupled reactions. And that's what gives your body energy. That's what's how your cells are able to do things like break down glucose and provide energy for your body. That's how your body is able to uh, perform all of the necessary functions, produce all the necessary proteins and enzymes that your body needs to stay alive. So your body needs that oxygen that you breathe in. So when you breathe out, you only breathe out uh, about, about 8% oxygen. The rest of the oxygen is absorbed by your body. And then your blood exchanges the oxygen that it takes in with carbon dioxide. So your body gives back off a lot of carbon dioxide. So therefore you're gonna be breathing out about 4% CO2. And then the rest of the percentages is other stuff. Okay. So my exhaled breath being a gas, and therefore the force of my exhaled breath had to be greater than the force holding that balloon stationary on the table. If my breath would not have been stronger than the force of the weight of the balloon holding it stationary on the table, then the balloon would not have moved. But my exhaled breath was strong enough to cause that balloon to move. So the force was great enough to cause the balloon to move a certain distance 
and therefore work was being done on that balloon. Because work, you have to have a force and the force has to be great enough to cause the object to move a certain distance and therefore work is being done. So work was being done on the balloon because the balloon moved. So therefore, we've got our air from my exhaled breath hitting the balloon. And therefore, the balloon moves. So does my air from my exhaled breath, being it's a gas, what does it have? What does it possess? Kinetic energy. Very good. What happened to the kinetic energy that my breath had? Did it get transferred to something else? What happened to that kinetic energy? Was it lost or destroyed? It, energy is never lost or destroyed. It's just what? Transferred or converted. So my exhaled breath, the kinetic energy was transferred to what? The balloon. The balloon. And that's what caused it to move. Very good. So now explain what the picture is saying. in words. So air was involved in two different parts of this uh, particular component of our lab. Of course, my breath has air, but there's also air in the inflated balloon, correct? That's how the balloon is inflated. There's air trapped inside of that inflated balloon. But can we see the air in the balloon? No, but we can see what it caused the balloon to do. Right. And so what evidence that we have that air is in it? Well, the balloon is inflated, right? The balloon's not flat. So it is inflated. So that's some evidence that there is something in the balloon. Even though we can't see the air, we know that the air is in that balloon because of the inflation of the balloon. And so the air, which is a gas, expands to fill the balloon. And that's why the balloon is inflated and taking on that round circular shape because of the expansion of that air from my breath that I used to blow the balloon up. So gases not only have kinetic energy, and therefore complete freedom of movement because their particles are spread out far apart from each other. Gases expand to fill the volume and shape of the container that they're in. In this case, the container is the balloon. Another important property of gases is that gases are compressible. And so that's how you can put a lot of gas into a propane tank and use that propane tank full of gas over and over again in your gas grill because you can pack a lot of gas into a small propane gas cylinder because gases are not only expandable, but they're also compressible.
So why did the balloon get bigger when I blew into it to inflate it? Because you were forcing gas into it. Right. I just transferred the air from my mouth to the balloon. And because air is a gas, it has kinetic energy, it can move from my mouth into the balloon. And then by tying off the balloon, I'm trapping that air in the balloon. So tie the balloon to trap the air inside. So this is the air for my breath. Here is the deflated balloon before I inflated it. And so the air goes into the balloon. And now the balloon is inflated. And then it's tied off with a knot. Now we've got air inside of the balloon. So basically the air was transferred from my breath to the balloon because the air has kinetic energy. It can move from one place to another. And so again, explain the illustration. Any questions about part C? So part D, simply sublime. So we talked about the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And so those three states can be interconverted one to another. So we can convert a solid to a liquid. That's called melting. It's also called fusion. And we can do the opposite. We can convert a liquid to a solid. And of course, that's freezing. We can also convert a liquid to a gas. And that is evaporation, which is also called vaporization. And then, of course, we can do the opposite. 
we can convert a gas into a liquid, and that is called condensation. And then the third set is that we can go from a solid directly to a gas. And that's called sublimation. And that is the subject of part D, simply sublime. And then with this one, you can also go in the opposite direction. You can convert a gas directly to a solid. And that is called deposition. Part D is going to focus on sublimation. So go ahead and watch part D video on your device and then go into your individual meeting rooms to discuss the questions for part D. And then we will return to the meeting room at about 1030.